Okay, everyone, thank you so much for coming to our fifth workshop on cell modeling. What we're going to be talking about today is uh, well, different workshops on model simulation. So, just to give a quick background on the, the uh, motivation in general, uh, this series is to give uh, guess different practical workshops on different aspects of skills one would need to do large scale modeling. Um, quick overview of the format and the goals. So, uh, first, I'm going to give a quick introduction to, to the topic, then we're going to have a workshop by Dr. Macklin, followed by a workshop uh, by Veronica. Then we'll have a group discussion about um, cell simulation in general and challenges the field, the field still needs to overcome. Uh, so the goals yeah. are... Yosef, sorry. Uh, right, right now your slides are not up. Interesting. Okay, one second. Can never get this right. Can you see them now? Yep, all good. Okay, cool. Thank you, Raga. Um, so the, 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 the goals of this are to identify uh, common challenges that our field still needs to face. Um, it's also an opportunity for individual people to sh share solutions to problems that uh, they themselves have found, and for us to come together to brainstorm new solutions, and finally, to create a, collabor a collaborative community of modelers. Um, the guidelines for the discussions are one, uh, around the side of commenting, of course, within being polite, but uh, if you feel like you have a comment that might be relevant, um, just go ahead and say it. There's a good chance that it is. There's no harm if it isn't. Um, honest debate is encouraged, and please mute your microphone when you're not talking. Okay, so just a, a quick overview of different si simulation or common simulation algorithms that exist. Okay, so one branch of simulation algorithms, this is true when you're really simulating anything, as a continuous state simulation. And that is you represent the different parts of your model as states. Um, and you have a system of equations that uh, control how they change in relation to time uh, continuously. And one very common example of this is just a regular system of ordinary differential equations. Another type of sim simulation algorithms are discrete event simulations. And that's when uh, changes occur by discrete events in time. Um, and as the simulation goes along, a different events occur and that changes the state. Um, one very common implementation of this algorithm in biology is the stochastic simulation algorithm. Um, a third branch of algorithms commonly used are steady state simulation. Um, this makes certain assumptions about uh, what equilibrium the system is in, uh, and then you can analyze it through that equilibrium. One, well, pretty much the example of this in biology is flux balance analysis. Um, another important distinction in different types of simulation methods are deterministic or prob probabilistic models. Deterministic model means you've de mathematically defined your model uh, in, I guess, a, a complete way, and uh, the outcome will be the same every time. And one example is just a basic system of differential equations is deterministic. Um, you can also have a, a, a prob probabilistic model, which is random. Uh, one, one example of biology is the stochastic simulation algorithm, where instead of uh, defining rates like you would do in a system with differential equations, you define probabilities and then uh, um, you randomize whether or not that uh, reaction or change occurs or not. Another um, important distinction between simulations is how the system is re represented. So one level could be systems dynamic simulation uh, where all the different interactions are like predefined top down. Um, this is in contrast to agent-based modeling, where you can define individual states and individual rules within specific components, and then larger patterns and complexity emerges from the interacting agents. Um, and you know, this is more emergent, where instead of defining the properties in a top-down manner, you define simpler agents and see how they all interact with one, one another. Um, so in terms of biology, there are different scales that simulation algorithms might want to capture, different scales of interactions. So you, know, you might want to have atom to atom interactions, molecule to molecule. Uh, you, may, you may want to abstract up to functional units like a protein, um, even if it's, if it's composed of, uh, I guess, many, like a protein complex, even if it's composed of many individual proteins or something like a mitochondria. You might want to define cell to cell interactions. Uh, there's also different gradations of spatial granularity. So if you're going to have um, a spatial dimension. One basic way you might do it is just by a compartment, where you'll essentially have 
uh, different components of molecules um, running their own simulation and uh, some, uh, some equation to control the movement of molecules from compartment to compartment. Um, you also might have uh, a 3D representation of space. Okay, so one, one cha special challenge in biology for all this is that many different uh, biological aspects or biological processes fit uh, better with one of these uh, simulation algorithms. So you may want to model transcription with um, something that captures variation, like the stochastic simulation algorithm. Uh, but you may want to model diffusion with just maybe an, an ODE because there's not much variance in diffusion. Uh, and ordinary different differential equations can be simulated much more quickly. Um, so this is just to say that different biological processes lend themselves better to specific algorithms. And one challenge is if you want to make a multi-scale model, how do you actually combine uh, all of these different uh, simulation algorithms into one? So one thing uh, that biology can use is, is hybrid simulation, where you essentially have some global state, um, many different simulation algorithms that can be run on whatever part of the model you want. Um, they all get integrated by modifying the global state. Just to give an example, maybe you think that transcription is best captured by the stochastic simulation algorithm. Maybe diffusion is best captured by ODE. Uh, maybe metabolism is best captured by FBA. So one thing that a simulation, uh, that Dr. Sauer does not think so, well, hey, noted. <laughs> um, but uh, it's important to be able to have a platform that uh, is able to let you define different processes using different algorithms. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, our first workshop, Dr. Macklin. Hi, thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, right now, this should look really recursive. Uh, let's, can you guys see my slides okay? Yep. Fantastic. So thank you so much for inviting me here today. Uh, this is a really neat workshop series, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it and uh, the great work you're doing here. Um, I want to go ahead and start off with just my acknowledgments to thank, you know, the fact that this work cannot be done by any one person anymore. It's, it's become too big, and uh, we're grateful for wonder, wonderful experimental and computational collaborators uh, across the U.S. and now across the world here and there. Um, and to have some high quality undergraduate and graduate students, and of course, Randy Highland, who's on the call today, who has been really one of the, the chief people to make Business Cell work. And so we're just absolutely grateful for all these partners. And it goes without saying, we're also grateful for some funding because we have to pay these people at some point. Um, and so we're very grateful to the National Cancer Institute, uh, the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, National Science Foundation, uh, Ted, Jane Christina's Ted Giovanni's Foundation for Health and Policy uh, for, for funding different parts of this work through the years. Um, and so I want to kind of start off by giving some context and also want to give a little bit of a disclaimer here. This talk is somewhat of an experiment for me. Usually I give a talk on uh, a little bit on the modeling platform and then a whole lot on the results coming out of it. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the modeling platform, but also about the, the bigger issues of trying to build from a single tool to something more of a software ecosystem uh, where we have people in the community contributing parts. And so hopefully that feeds into the, the theme you guys are looking at. Uh, to motivate this work, uh, we work primarily in cancer, although we work in other systems too. And we realize that cancer is a very complex systems problem. As, as Yosef's great introduction pointed out, this stuff happens at a variety of spatial temporal scales. You have individual cell behaviors. You have uh, a variety of processes going on in each individual cell. Uh, they're not working in isolation. They communicate with one another and influence their behavior. They trade chemical and mechanical signals. Uh, all that is happening in an environment that imposes physical constraints. Uh, oxygen and growth factors can only go so far. Communication is often diffusive and has distance limits, and there are time lags of communication. Um, and of course, they are remodeling that environment. So there are dynamical feedbacks all across the scales. And then you have things like systems of systems. Uh, the system of an individual immune cell talks to the system of a different immune cell, and together they become the immune system. And then that interacts with other systems uh, down the road. And diseases often occur when one or more parts of these systems falls out of balance and becomes dysregulated. And many treatments today are working on targeting individual parts of these systems. And so it's no great surprise that when you're working on a complex system, if you muck with one piece, you get unintended side effects that percolate through that system. And so 
you get things like uh, resistance to therapy, you get extra angiogenesis, you get poor drug delivery if you're trying to block the, uh, the blood vessels, uh, you, you get all sorts of things you didn't expect. And so we need to start treating this as the broader complex system, not as the individual parts to deal with this. And the study of the complex multicellular system is multicellular systems biology. And if we meet our goals and get to the point where we can not just understand the system but control it, then we've arrived at multicellular systems engineering. So that's kind of the goal. And in these kinds of problems, uh, scientists use models to detangle these complex systems. Um, uh, often those be animal models or engineered models or in vitro models. But in this case, I'm going to show you that we are creating a mathematical modeling system to understand these complex systems. And so there are several key components for building not just the model, but the workflows that you need to kind of accomplish real work. Uh, first, you need the core framework. And this is where many people kind of stop working because it becomes all encompassing to drive your core framework. But you also need to be able to run it in high throughput to do true studies and investigations. You need to be able to share your work with other people and encourage them to make use of it. And you need to build broader community to make it sustainable and to uh, scale beyond the efforts of a single lab to get the full utility of the model frameworks you built and to study the bigger problems. And so what I'd like to do is to not, originally when I thought I was giving this talk, I thought I focused pretty much only on number one. But I think really it's an opportunity to talk about the broader ecosystem uh, aspects of this problem. Uh, so just kind of give you an overview of business cell and the, and the base framework here. This all started off realizing that for diffusion, you need to be able to solve not just one or two diffusion equations, but five or 10 or 20. Oxygen, glucose, more growth factors, signaling factors, a waste product or two, a drug or two. It's very easy to get to five or 10 diffusion equations. And if you just solve them serially, it's not going to scale well. And so we developed uh, something called BioFBM, which is a finite volume method. That, can, that really studies an entire um, vector of diffusion equations simultaneously. And it works nicely on th in 3D on a single desktop workstation. We parallelized it with OpenMP. Uh, we scaled it all the way up to 128, I think, diffusion substrates. And it slows to a crawl at that point, but it scales linearly and the slope is less than one. This is all open and platform and uh, open source and cross platform and notably, we use the same code without modification on Windows, OS X, Linux, and other platforms without any modification, source code without requiring virtual machines. You can just compile it and run it natively. And we view that that cross-platform compatibility is really important for having a truly reproducible platform that people can, can try out in different places, not be tied to one place. Um, on top of that, we built Physicel, which is kind of our main product right now, uh, which adds off lattice agents into that multi-substrate um, multi environment. So the cells uh, each have an individual state and position, can attach custom functions and custom data dynamically on a cell-by-cell -cell basis at runtime. And then the cells exchange mechanical forces, they can sample the environment, and they can put signals back into the environment, progressive cell cycle, death processes, and, and all sorts of things. So it's fairly, flexible and uh, cross, also cross-platform. We run this Windows, OS X, Linux, BSD, all sorts of systems uh, without any modification. And uh, we have used it all the way from undergraduate education all the way through our core research efforts. So it seems to be accessible to a lot of people. We scaled it up to about 10 to the five or 10 to the six cells on a desktop workstation. And here our goal is to say, not, let's not run one massive 10 billion cell simulation, but instead run thousands of medium-sized simulations simultaneously for the, for the scaling. And though this is recently published uh, about a year ago, plus computational biology, and we were very fortunate to get a, a research prize for that. So we, we hope you'll try it out. Um, so let's see here. Uh, oh, so just kind of give some examples of the versatility of this framework. Uh, we can do 2D and 3D problems. You can do things where, for example, you introduce a bunch of agents to represent the liver parenchyma and look at biomechanical feedbacks between the two. Uh, you can introduce different cell types and do things like immunotherapy models. Uh, you can do hypothesis testing, saying what happens if you have hypoxic cells behave differently than uh, normal cells in cancer, and how long do you retain, retain a, a hypoxic phenotype if you leave a hypoxic zone? And that turns out to have real consequences in terms of how well cancer can disseminate. And so these are just some examples of the types of problems. And if this were a typical talk, I spent my whole time expanding on these three pictures. Unfortunately, I need to just say, here's a snapshot of the cool things you can do with it and then continue moving. 
um, ongoing and future work. We've been saying, you know, now that we're getting to a point where the platform basically works, now what we need to fill in to fill in the gaps? And a lot of it gets down to usability. Uh, starting uh, last year, we started adding XML-based configuration files and adding more and more model specification into the XML. So you can say, we want people to spend less time coding C++ and more time just thinking about what the model rules are. And uh, down the road, we hope to include more of that. Um, also been adding features. Uh, for example, we recently added the ability for each cell to say, I've removed substrates and environments, now track that internalization in the mass conserving way. And then if the cells want to release something, you can create the stuff inside and then pump it out of the cell. So this will be, I think, critical for interfacing with molecular scale models. Uh, in the future, we want to add you know, some things we're missing, like better biomechanics, better cell uh, directional polarization. Uh, but these are all things where we hope that eventually the community can start contributing. And of course, there's always the quest to increase computational power and efficiency. So we were looking at various high performance computing uh, architectures to accelerate it that requires adding MPI around the code. Uh, so we have a basic core framework. Now we submit the microenvironment, put cells in, you can add other custom model rules, do custom data and apply to a lot of problems. Uh, but now you want to be able to do big investigations. So suppose, for example, you have a big 3D immune therapy model, and you did some work, and you say, well, one run is basically a toy model, a fun prototype, a, a demo. But now suppose we've identified a few parameters that are important, and you want to say, look at low, medium, high values of each of those parameters, that's 27 parameter sets. But it's a stochastic model, so you'd better do multiple replicates. So now, let's say 270 model runs, it takes about a weekend to run a model in full 3D, that's a year and a half of solid computing. So just a small investigation is pretty, uh, pretty daunting. So the only way to do this is by, to put it onto high throughput computing. So we have teamed up with Argonne National Lab to help us develop these workflows. And so now, instead of running those models sequentially, we can run all 170 of them distributed across a cluster at the same time and start doing analysis you know, right at the end. So this whole study moves from a year and a half to a weekend. And we're working to kind of further accelerate that. So one way you can do that is say, now suppose you want to do even bigger parameter spaces. For example, constrained, constrained problems, where the constraints represent the edges of your, simulate, of your parameter space. Well, six-dimensional space gets really hard, and you can't just blanket the whole space with simulations and expect to get through it, even with supercomputing. And so what you do is you active learning to help guide your exploration of parameter space. You, uh, for example, say, if you can write your problem way that you have some kind of a binary decision, did I meet some design objective or not? Then you can divide your parameter space into a binary classification. And then what you do is you run your simulations, uh, a whole bunch of them at a time in a cluster, but rather than blanketing parameter space, you choose your simulations to refine the decision boundary between the true and the false regions. And then if you kind of nest those problems, you can start getting at the topology of your design spaces. So by combining machine learning and uh, high, you know, high performance computing, you can attack new problems and understand the topology of design spaces, even for complex models like this. And so for this example, we found that each uh, contour in our contour space, uh, parameter space, took around 30 to 40,000 simulations rather than 10 or 20 million simulations. So we were able to get it done in a few hours. So over the course of the weekend now, we got the topology of a high dimensional parameter space, which would not have been feasible without combining these approaches. So, and the other thing that's nice is when you combine machine learning approaches and build these decision trees, the Gini coefficients give you new ways to interpret your model because you can start ranking the importance of your parameters. Uh, other people are trying to use these approaches now to get at things like uncertainty quantification. So I think just by combining a detailed enough simulation platform, which is your model system, uh, with high performance computing to run many, many simulations well and feasibly at the same time, and machine learning to help guide your exploration and guide your, your interpretation, I think it opens up some new methods in science to, to learn new lessons. So that's kind of where we are today. Down the road, we want to find new ways to add uh, machine learning to approximate bits and parts of the models, the surrogate models, and then use them to skip computational steps for further uh, acceleration. And that's something that we're just starting to do, but it's, I think, kind of the cutting edge work for us right now. Okay, so we have a model platform. We can export in high throughput and start to interpret it. Uh, but if you don't share this work with other people, it doesn't get built upon and it, it's not as useful as it could be. So let's talk a little bit about uh, sharing and outreach. Um, so I kind of like to take a big 
bit of a trip back in time to say, what did model sharing mean at different eras of even just my graduate career? When I was a PhD student, model sharing meant you wrote down your equations. And then everyone was welcome to reproduce your model. All they had to do was hire a postdoc, code up the entire model from scratch, test it, debug it, and then, you know, years or two later, you might reproduce the result. Wasn't that fantastic? Uh, I mean, that's the model, that's what I came up with in uh, computational fluids, and it's a PhD math student. Oh, and sometimes you might share your code, but of course it came with strings, like you can't publish anything without me being a co-author. Really nice. Um, now, when I was early faculty, things had improved. People were starting to post source code. Every now and then, they would even use a standardized OSI license, so you could figure out whether you could actually use the codes, which is kind of nice. Every now and then, they might use a repository, but it would often just be embedded as supplementary material in a paper. So you know, it was a little better, uh, but still not there. At least you didn't have to hire a postdoc to redo your work, although you found that the code was so poorly documented, you still have to hire a postdoc to actually figure out how to run the code. And here, we're, in fact, this brings us to where we are today on reusability. Uh, you usually uh, share your model on GitHub, which is great. You have a standardized license, that's great. Uh, so you go and you clone the repository, you track down all the dependencies, which may be a game killer right there. You might successfully compile. So if you make it past step three, you're already more reproducible than most models. Uh, then you have to learn the syntax and actually run the model and then learn how to load the data and visualize the results. So you pretty much still have to hire a postdoc to actually reproduce any results. And the net result is many codes that are even if they're shared are never actually used. So I think this is a big problem. Uh, so we're trying to get around this problem in multiple ways. One is to say, we have this beautiful agent-based model. You know, we think it's beautiful, I disagree. Uh, but it's command line C++, not exactly the most user-friendly stuff in the world, and it still requires compiling. Okay, there are other frameworks where you at least don't have to compile, but it doesn't get around the usability aspects. So we took a step back and said, can we process our XML configuration files and auto-generate a Jupyter notebook to wrap around the simulation as a graphical user interface? Because what you want to do is you don't want to impose extra usability work on individual modelers. They want to work on their modeling, but you do want to make it easy to build a GUI at when the time is right. And so we pass the, the project through this Python script, generate the Jupyter Notebook, and then this creates a graphical front end. And then you just kind of click and set the settings. Uh, it will write your configuration file and pass it to the executable, run it in the background, and upload the data back into your notebook for visualization. So all in one stop. And we hope to make that more and more sophisticated over time. And Randy Highland, who's on this call, has really been leading this work and doing fantastic work with undergraduate help. So now then, you can also say, now take that notebook and executable, stick it up on the cloud, like on NanoHub, and now you have a cloud-hosted version of your model. No compiling required, no download required. Just open a web browser and hope you have bandwidth. Um, and make sure you don't have 16 gigs of memory open, you know, bogged down in Chrome. But um, there you go. So, you know, this gives us new scenarios. Now we can take any agent-based model that we can create in our framework and automatically create a cloud-hosted version of that model. Uh, we're hoping that improves uh, reproducibility and at least a way of sharing the mathematics of a model. Uh, now we actually are, as standard practice in our lab, are including a publication companion app of the core model as part of the method session so that reviewers and readers can interactively play with the model that's a kind of at the core of a paper as they're reading that paper and get an intuition of it and learn about the limitations of the model and then hope they reuse it for themselves. The other thing too is because it's all on the web, you can make nice QR codes and start embedding this try this model yourself type stickers in your talk slides. So there's another way to kind of supplement your work and do extra outreach. So that's kind of now we have some ways to share the codes and encourage some participation. In fact, down the road, I'd like to see it where people build rapid fire apps and actually share them with each other. It's like, here's my idea, try it out. And then someone says, oh no, that's terrible. And then they share their app. And so uh, cloud-hosted models could be a new method of actually uh, doing math communication with each other, which sounds like mass communication with a stutter, but it's math communication. So that's kind of there, but now we want to start building community. And so we are very fortunate to have just gotten in supplement from the National Cancer Institute on our year one, and we're gonna do a year of physics cell. So this semester, we're building new training materials for physics cell to help people learn how to use the code. Uh, in the spring, we're going to run a hackathon to say, can people come and help us build model components? And then in the summer, we'll support some long-term visitors to actually sit down with them for six weeks to help them build something 
and, and lead to some kind of a publishable tool or model result. So kind of to zero in on this just a little bit more detail, um, we've been developing training materials. And so far we have a very thorough user guide, which is painstakingly written and handwritten LaTeX, not scalable. Uh, we have a handful of NanoHub-based uh, apps. For example, here is a, an app you can use to try out motility to learn about biased random migration. We have sample projects in every download, and you know, every now and then we have a Business Hub Friday on Twitter where you can, where we might share a tutorial or blog post of some kind. In progress now is with the NCI grant, we're going to take that user guide and transform it into a true community curated wiki so people can help with the documentation. Uh, we're working on training modules, each of which will have both associated code, PowerPoint, recorded talk, and a micro app based on NanoHub that's actually embedded right there in the talk to say, learn about this particular aspect of the code base. And then we'll put it all on physicel.org when we're done. Uh, we want to make a, a tools ecosystem because it's not just enough to have that core framework. You need uh, a full workflow. And so we have just now started, uh, we made a GitHub organization and collected repos across our lab to kind of collect them in one place. For example, Python data loading, uh, a utility that can help you convert your simulation outputs to pop racings for 3D ray tracing and pretty visualization. And we hope to down the road figure out how the community can contribute to these officially sanctioned uh, tools that really improve the usability of the model. So you don't just run the models, but you actually do something useful with them. Uh, we think down the road, we're also going to need a similar ecosystem for plugins. For example, adding live Roadrunner in an officially supported, well-documented way. And that's going to require a lot of work, which we're happy to talk about. In particular, clear separation and plugin architecture to understand where one starts and the other one begins. And I think also proper provenance metadata so that people know, say, I ran this model with these plugins, with these version numbers, and here are the citations to give full credit to the people who created them. So I do see some questions popping up. Should we just wait for a moment or go into them? Uh, Yusef, you're actually uh, muted. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, you keep going. We'll, we'll, we'll take the questions at the end. OK, thank you. And actually, we're just about through here. Uh, down the road, we want to share not just in the plugins, uh, but also uh, sample model components. And we have had some practice with Visiboss, which told us both the wins, like you get a brand new modeling capability, say Boolean signal networks, but also the perils. We found that, that when we prototyped this, the two codes were too intertwined without a clear separation. So now you can either use Visiboss with a really, really old version of Visicell, or you can use a new version of Visicell, but not with Visiboss. And so now we're trying to really say, what have we learned from this? Can we step back and get a true separation in API and protocols for connecting plugins and supporting them? And down the road, I think we'll need to do similar for sharing model components, like an angiogenesis model or a library of immune cell types. And again, all this is going to require some clear documentation and standards that help that, but aren't so hard to satisfy that no one will ever actually follow the rules. So that will, I think, be a, a challenge here. So, that's kind of an overview of what we've been building, starting with our core modeling capabilities, uh, work to run them in high throughput, work to document them and train people how to use them and share them with the community. And now we're really looking to find community contributions to kind of go to the next step. So thank you very much for this opportunity today. Thank you, Dr. Macklin. That was just an incredibly interesting talk. Um, generally, we have questions after both workshops present, but um, Bianca wanted to know uh, if people are interested in the two-week summer school, how can they get more information? How can get more information on the code or? Oh, I'm not, I think I'm joining the, the summer school. Oh, so right now we haven't sent up the details for this, uh, the, the hackathon. Uh, one place to, to watch, you know, watch, um, watch uh, our, the physicel hashtag on Twitter. We, we share a lot of information there. Uh, we do have a mailing list, uh, which we, I, maybe Randy can paste the hyperlink for that mailing list into the code. Um, and that's been one place where we also spread information, but I'd say primarily online on Facebook, Twitter, um, and we'll certainly send out information, for example, to the NCI, PSON, CSBC mailing lists uh, when we have more details in the hackathon. Ah, nice. And then we'll, we'll deal with the content question. Go to the project website. Physicel.org will redirect. Oops, I should have HTTP here. 
and we would love people to come get in touch with us. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Macklin. Now I'd like to present Avronika Perevsky, Perevsky, presenting on tellurium and antimony. Okay. All right, thanks, Yosef, and uh, thank you for a great talk, Dr. Macklin. Uh, really quickly, I'm just gonna post a link to a Jupyter Notebook in Collaboratory in the chat. Uh, so if you want to follow along with, with me, you can. Uh, there will be one caveat to that, but I'll mention that in a second. Okay. Um, does everything, can you see my slides okay? Okay, cool. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about Tellurium and Lib Roadrunner primarily, and also uh, the modeling language antimony, which is integrated in Tellurium. Um, I'm a PhD student in Dr. Herbert Sorrow's lab uh, in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Washington. And th these projects that I'm going to talk about today have been developed by all the amazing researchers that have gone before me. I am primarily a user, so I just wanted to acknowledge some of the primary developers right off the bat. Uh, for Tellurium, Kiri Choi Kyle and Kyle Medley are two of the primary developers, and Matthias has done a great deal of debugging. Uh, Lib Roadrunner was largely developed initially by Andy Samogi, and um, again, Matthias contributed a lot of debugging to the development of Lib Roadrunner. Kyle worked on development of the original Lib Roadrunner, and then Andrew Hu, Fei Yu, and Andrew Briand are all working on a updated version of Lib Roadrunner currently. And then Antimony is, has primarily been engineered by Lucian Smith. Uh, so all of these individuals are incredible and have done really great work that you'll see today. Uh, a few links to rel relevant resources. You can um, get the Tellurium installation instructions. There are multiple ways to install Tellurium. So, um, you can decide which option is best for you. You may want to install a spider-like IDE for Tellurium, and this will essentially allow you to have your own Python distribution associated with Tellurium, so you don't have to alter any distribution on your computer. Um, Tellurium documentation and Lib Roadrunner documentation are both on Read the Docs. And then also, if you like, you can use the Tellurium environment on NanoHub. Um, I think, uh, that was mentioned in the chat that you need a login, but it is free, so uh, feel free to experiment with Tellurium there. And then just the caveat I mentioned is that right now Tellurium and LibRunner don't support uh, Python 3.7. That should be coming out soon. Um, but you do need to use a Python 3.6 distribution for this code. So if you don't have that currently on your computer, you can use one of those alternative options I mentioned. Okay, so to start off, uh, we want to talk about what kinetic modeling is because this is the type of modeling that is applicable to Tellurium and Lib Roadrunner. And we know that chemical kinetics study the factors that influence the rate of chemical reactions. So these could be concentration, temperature, lighter catalysts, along with several other factors. And um, chemical reaction networks are largely the framework we use for building all types of dynamical models, which could be genetic circuits, cell signaling pathways, metabolic networks, and many other types of um, molecule, molecular interaction networks uh, within the cell. Uh, so some types of kinetic models that exist, uh, um, Yosef mentioned some of these in his introduction, but you could have agent-based, algebraic models, Boolean models, constraint-based, differential equations, statistical and machine learning methods, or stochastic models. Uh, and the two that are supported by Tellurium are gonna be differential equations models and stochastic. Um, models as well. So how does numerical simulation help us model kinetics? Well, essentially, computers provide a method to approximate analytical solutions for complex and often nonlinear systems that can't be solved um, um, readily. Uh, so kinetic laws describe the rates of change of species in the system, and these rates of change can be modeled mathematically. As I mentioned, we're going to be using differential equations. Um, and for sufficiently large networks, simulators must be efficient and perform rapid numerical integration, or we'll be waiting for our computers to run our simulations for a very long period of time. Um, specifically, differential equations models are those that describe how variables in a system evolve over time. So these could be, these are the floating species or the variable species concentrations. 
Um, quantities can be derived from these variables, like the pathway flux through the network. Some parameters of the model may be fixed by the modeler, like rate constants, enzyme concentrations, or boundary species concentrations. And uh, deterministic differential equations are really useful when we can assume that there are a large number of participants in the chemical reaction um, and, and that the uh, reactions described by our model are likely to um, occur at, uh, continuously, whereas stochastic models are useful when we have dilute systems where the reactions may not occur at every time point, so it happens probabilistically. Okay, so to address some of these modeling, uh, or to perform this type of modeling, Tellurium and Lib, Runner, Lib Roadrunner support very rapid simulation and analysis of kinetic models. Um, Tellurium is an integrated environment based on Python, so it allows you to access or integrate within a Python script any of the libraries that you already have installed with Python, which allows you to use numerical methods, symbolic analysis, visualization that already exists. And then Tellurium also comes with several libraries that are directly relevant to modeling. So it supports standards in kinetic modeling. SBML would be the primary standard for our field and it's fully supported by Tellurium. Um, it also supports SETML, which is our simulation description. Um, and then modeling support for modeling support, it provides the library antimony, which I'll talk about in a moment, but this is a human readable model definition uh, language. Uh, it also supports LibRoadRunner, which um, performs very rapid uh, numerical simulation for ODEs. It can perform metabolic control analysis. It can perform stochastic simulations and um, ultimately, LibRoadRunner is one of the fastest simulators out there, 10 times faster than the top simulators, uh, top simulation, simulator competitors. Uh, and then additionally, it has um, options for different utilities and many of the utilities using Tellurium um, can be augmented by um, other Python libraries. So we're going to get started and most of the rest of my talk will be um, direct practical use of Tellurium. So hopefully you'll get an idea how to just jump in and start using it. Uh, it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, so importing relevant packages, we're just going to import a couple, uh, Tellurium itself, uh, Roadrunner, NumPy, uh, which is the scientific computing package, uh, random to generate random numbers and matplotlib.pylab, which just, um, is a very common map, um, Python plotting library that will, um, again, help augment the plotting available through Tellurium. So I want to introduce the antimony language now, just so you have an idea of how to write models easily. Um, with very simple example, uh, this is the conversion of species S1 to species S2. It has, this reaction has a rate constant K1 and its rate law is defined using mass action. So the rate constant times the concentration of species S1 uh, would be our rate law. And we can write this really easily in antimony. Um, so antimony models are simply a string. Uh, you can name your model. You can specify the compartments you want in your model if you are going to have uh, reactions occurring in multiple compartments. Here, we're just specifying a single compartment, which uh, if you don't add this, you know, that would be the default. Uh, you can note which species are in your model, uh, and then you assign initial conditions for the species. You allocate species to their uh, compartment if you have compartments, and you can then write the reactions that are involved in your model. So in this case, um, uh, the reaction is named J1, and then you have species S, S1 is converted to species S2 um, with a rate law of K1 times the concentration of S1, current concentration of S1, and then assign your constant value, values uh, to your global parameters. And that is the full uh, string for the model I just, or for the network I just showed. Um, and I'm just assigning this to the variable ant string. So then once you've defined your model, you can access the simulation capabilities by, of 
available in libroadrunner by loading the model to a uh, roadrunner object instance here. Just in this case, we're calling it R. Um, so this is performed using the command uh, te or tellurium dot load a load antimony model uh, of your string. And then you can simulate, you give the, the start time, the end time, and the number of points you want to simulate with. And then you can plot the simulation results you've just created using uh, and use some uh, specifications to make your plot look a little more defined. Okay, so this has just simulated the model from time zero to time 10 with, 10, with 100 points and um, plotted the concentration of both of the species in the model. Okay, so that's a really simple model. Um, it's really easy to add events to your antimony strings, which would be some change that occurs at a very discrete time or um, as specified, for instance, by a concentration of a species value in, the in your model. So here I've just added an event line here, named it e E1, and so at time greater than five, S1 will be um, set to 10. So what this ultimately creates is a spike in the concentration of S1 at time 10, or time five, sorry. And then similarly, uh, just an, another example using events where it's dependent on the concentration of S1. So when the concentration of S1 falls below 0 0.005, uh, it will, the concentration again will have another spike added. So you can easily create events based on concentrations or the current time in your model. Okay, so the previous examples I've showed you have been deterministic simulations. So given the same initial conditions, the um, output of the model would be uh, the same. Uh, so, but Tellurium, our LibRoadRunner also has the Gillespie algorithm for stochastic simulations. And um, we can show that with a very simple model here. Uh, it's the same model we've used before uh, with just defined in a very simple string. Uh, you can set the integrator you're using with Roadrunner um, with this command. And if you specify a seed value, then um, essentially you'll be able to make the output of this, of this block of code deterministic because it will always have the same uh, sequence of events. But if you don't specify the uh, seed value, uh, if you don't specify the seed value, you'll get a different distribution each, each time you run this simulation. Um, just to highlight this, this block of code kind of emphasizes why it's so useful to have Tellurium and LibRoadRunner integrated with Python because it allows us to make use of um, standard programming with um, loops and it just makes it very easy to uh, make the exact changes that you want uh, for your code uh, rather than potentially working with a GUI of some sort which might be a little more limited in some situations. Okay, so when I've ran the simulation, you can see multiple trajectories. We've created 50 trajectories. And the alpha factor here is just changing the, the opacity of the trajectories. But um, again, you can get multiple uh, distributions if you don't specify the seed value here. And then just really quickly, there's also, you can also, instead of setting the integrator, you can also, in in lieu of writing r.simulate, you can write r.gillespie and specify the start time and end time, and it'll perform the same um, simulation. Here, I don't have a seed value set, so if I run this multiple times, the distribution will change slightly each time. Okay, so then just really quickly, uh, the example I showed you with antimony was using a uh, mass action rate law, but Obviously, you can have pretty complex rate laws. It really can be, uh, you can, this will allow you to write any type of rate law you're interested in. So just a very simple example that maybe you're familiar with would be the rep repressilator circuit from Elowitz and Liebler from 2000, uh, where essentially you have three genes being uh, translated into proteins and um, each protein inhibits one of the 
genes involved in this network. So you have three uh, repression interactions in this network. And this is just to show what the antimony string for this could look like where M1 would be one of the mRNAs, P1 would be one of the proteins, and so on. And you can write more complex rate laws. For example, you may want to write an enzyme catalyzed reaction, so you could use Michaelis Menten. Um, as long as you can write it, you have the option to use it with uh, the antimony language. So uh, we'll load this string. And then just to show the simulation for this string. Okay. Uh, um, and then further to emphasize the utility of antimony specifically, I mentioned that antimony is a human readable language. So because Solarium supports SBML and we ideally will be using SBML in all of our modeling processes to make it more reproducible, um, it's a very useful language, but uh, or a very useful description format, but um, it's not the easiest to understand just by looking at it, and it really requires a computer to deeply analyze it, but Antimony provides that human-readable format. So uh, just here's an example of what the SBML would look like. Uh, it's quite extensive. You have many different features which are very useful for reproducibility, but not the easiest for comprehension just by inspecting it visually. So in comparison, the antimony for the same model would um, show you exactly, these are the reactions. Here they are 0 to 11. Uh, here are all, where all of our species are initialized. Here are all of our uh, constant values in the model. So it makes it pretty easy to understand. Tellurium also provides important export capabilities so that we can um, easily um, import SBML, export as antimony, import CellML, export as SBML. Um, it makes it very easy to convert between uh, formats. So here's an example. I'm going to import the, uh, this uh, metabolic model by Jana Wolf from 2001 from the Biomodels database. So this is also a really useful feature of Tellurium. Uh, so oh, just here's, a, here's what the network looks like for this model in case you're interested. Uh, and so to load directly from the Biomodels database, you can use te.loadSBML model and, and specify the Biomodel ID in the uh, URL. And so that will directly load your SBML model into a Roadrunner instance, and then you'll be able to simulate it. So here is a short simulation. And something I did didn't mention earlier is that it's really easy to add specific selections. So if you're only interested in the species in uh, simulating one of the species, uh, you can just specify time, uh, the species, and this should just plot one of your species in the output. Uh, and so we showed you import, but there's also the opportunity to export very easily. So here, uh, the model I just loaded, which is still uh, saved as this Roadrunner instance, I can reset it um, back to, I can reset all the initial, uh, initial values and then um, ultimately export to an antimony file, which will be saved to my current directory. And then I can uh, import or load the uh, antimony I just saved to my current directory again and simulate. So import and export with Tellurium is very simple. Uh, and then just to run through several useful matrices and vectors that Tellurium has available, um, you can readily calculate the stoichiometry matrix. Uh, and there are some shortcuts with all these examples I'm going to provide. Um, uh, this can be really useful for uh, multiple additional analyses you might be interested in running. Uh, the Jacobi matrix can also be computed readily. Um, you can uh, get all the reaction rates for all of your floating species in the model, uh, or floating species reactions in the model. Um, and you can get the rates of change for all of your floating species. Uh, you can get your floating species concentrations readily as well. 
uh, the names of all your floating species, which can make it very easy if you uh, need to access or want to access, for example, for plotting, if you want to access, um, recall some of your floating species IDs and use those for plotting. Uh, makes it very simple. And you can do the same with um, getting the global parameter IDs. Again, all of these are just accessing a specific uh, list within uh, your model that's saved as R. Oh, sorry. And then if you want to get into more advanced analysis using Tellurium, um, there are a lot of options here, but I'll just go through a couple of them. Uh, you can compute the steady state uh, call, by calling r.steadyState and then um, printing the floating species concentrations following that. I'll just show you what your floating species concentrations are at steady state. Sorry, this is incorrect. Um, you can also compute the eigenvalues, which you might use to determine the stability of your system uh, under a current parameter regime. So here it would just be get full eigenvalues. Uh, and so here you have a negative eigenvalue, which would suggest that the system, or negative real eigenvalue, which would su suggest that is stable. Um, another possibility would be parameter scans and plotting. And this is another good example of the use of Python programming. Uh, so here you can just write a for loop to do multiple simulations where at each uh, at each iteration through the for loop, you're updating the value of k1. So k1 can be accessed by r.k1, and it can be set to whatever value you're at in your um, uh, list, and then uh, run the simulation. So if you do this multiple times, you get an output that shows uh, uh, how your output will appear at each time you update the parameter value of interest. So this can be really useful for sensitivity analysis, potentially. Um, great. And then just really quickly, we'll go through just a couple of uh, potentially useful um, ways to change the integrator and steady state solver settings because those will affect the, uh, will affect the output of your simulation um, and potentially will affect the speed of your uh, numerical integration. So you can get the, R dot, uh, the integrators that are available through Tellurium, which right now there are five. Um, CVODE, which is from the Sundial suite, is the default um, and it performs rapid stiff and non-stiff numerical integration. You also have Gillespie, which is the stochastic uh, integrator we have available, Runga Kata met methods, and also Euler. Um, for the steady state solvers, there are two available currently, which are NLEQ 1 and 2. These both implement different uh, variations of the Newton method and are very efficient for solving for the steady state. Uh, and then uh, you can get information about the steady state solver, uh, which will tell you some of the parameters that you can potentially tune to make to fit your needs. And in order to actually make those changes, you would just call r.steadyStateSolver and then you can access those parameters and change them as necessary. Okay, running short on time. So um, with that, I just, um, I hope you have an idea of at least how to get started using Tellurium. It's really quite simple and um, also very well documented. So the links I put at the beginning um, should help if you are looking for more complex analyses. Um, just to acknowledge all the team that has contributed to Tellurium, Lib Roadrunner, and Antimony, and as well as the funding that has supported it over the years. This has definitely um, required the expertise of a large number of people, and I think they have created a really incredible software that facilitates kinetic modeling. Thank you, guys. Okay, so... Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Professor Paul McLean. So we are going to start now with the discussion. If you, uh, you should be able to see now the last slide of the presentation, including some uh, questions to, to guide a little bit this discussion. I don't know. Uh, now it should be there. Okay. 
Okay. So I would like to start first because we have a question in the chat for specifically for. Uh, oops, it's not working. For Veronica, that is about the support for SVML packages in Tellurium. But I think it's a good question also for Professor Paul McLean in order to know uh, what is your opinion about the different standard applications in the, in the platform that you presented today, which is a, always a, an open question when we work in modeling, that is the, the application of a standard. So if uh, you want to start, Veronica, or... Uh, sorry, which, which question? Did you want to address the uh, SQL support? Basically, in the chat, we have a question from Fenka Fang. So, if you want to check right. it, but basically, it was related to SBML. Uh, right. The, so, uh, well, go for it. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Saro just added his um, response to that question in the chat. But um, yeah, he mentioned that distribution, composition, layout, and render are supported or layout and render will be released very soon through um, some software that's being developed by the lab. Uh, but it is largely supported. Okay, there are lots of technical questions. Okay. Should I address more of the questions in the chat just because I think most of them are... I can, uh, I can reply on the, the why is it the fastest. Um, Okay, so I, I think I have any problems with the headphones, but I will try to, to read the chat at the same time. Uh, so basically the, the discussion was starting with the, for a, pe a person that, for example, has no experience or a very a small experience in uh, simulation things. Biological problems would be the steps that you would recommend in order to, to choose a proper simulation framework. And who to know if that framework would be adequate uh, beforehand. So, Professor Paul, my colleague. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the full question. Oh, so, yeah, I think the question is, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, we, sorry, so we are in the first point. Well, to, uh, I guess, I'll ask the question again. Um, when you're considering a certain biological process, um, what steps might one consider for deciding which simulation algorithms best capture the biology that you want to represent? Because there are like lots of different simulation algorithms out there. Um, so, what are some considerations that you guys might think? Um, well, I I guess like obviously you covered some of the interesting ones in the beginning, just like whether or not you're interested in deterministic simulations or stochastic, that would be important. Some might only support one or the other. Uh, I think there's probably always a trade-off between like potentially accuracy of solving your system versus speed of solving it. And for larger models, um, there might be some compromise. You might be okay with making some compromises to accuracy in order to achieve Appropriate, appropriate speed to run the simulation. Uh, so I guess that might be one consideration. It's funny, there's also the, the pragmatic and the even economic aspect of that. Where can you get, where can you answer your question most easily and quickly? And is that is it better to take longer to use it in the absolutely perfect platform uh, than it is to answer it a little bit faster in the platform you know and have today? And hopefully model portability will help make that less and less of a consideration. But if it takes you four months to write a model in a new framework that's perfect for you, so you can write it in one week instead of one month, you may not have actually saved any time. And so this, these are things I think that are also worth considering, and hopefully your work will help make that less of a consideration. Now that you brought that up, I'm actually curious to hear more about how you combine model construction with machine learning, because this is sort of 
a perspective I had not considered much before of uh, spending much less time on the model, but running, I guess, lots and lots of simulations and using machine learning to analyze the model better. Um, do you have any more thoughts on that trade-off or new insights for uh, your use of machine learning to analyze model results? Well, we're, we're really quite a bit at the beginning of this right now. It's, it's kind of exciting and new to try new things. Uh, we have seen real gains though, because certainly when you run a brute force, you know, blanket, uh, you know, blanket your entire parameter space densely and in sample, a lot of your simulations do basically the same thing. And so the machine learning there has really helped us kind of weed out simulations we don't need to do. Now, I think ideally you do need to test that, right? And say, let's pick some points within one region or another region of this parameter space and, and make sure they really do behave similarly. But we found that it has been exciting and uh, that it is giving us some more power to run those simulations in high throughput. And traditionally, you know, first we're just uh, constrained by computational resources. You can't run every model you want to. Um, but also, even if you could, we are constrained in the analytic capabilities. And that's, I think, the next place we're starting to work. If you generate thousands of simulations, can you actually understand what you saw in them? And I think uh, a lot of that is going to be solved with things like machine vision. Can you do event detection in the simulation? Can you automatically add annotations like this tumor grew, this tumor shrank, this one formed invasive fingers, this one formed layers, this one did not. Uh, people do that already, but mostly ad hoc hand-tuned uh, metrics that are designed to specific problems. It'd be very nice though, if that could be made more generalized and extensible. So you can even start comparing simulations from very different models and, and understanding. And I think it also facilitate comparing to the actual uh, data and biology. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, I think, a fun area right now and, and one that needs a lot of help. So um... We have, I think, close to five to 10 minutes more. So uh, I would like to say that as, as we don't have time to cover all the questions, do you, are you more interested in covering some of those or you want to yeah, start from the beginning and we start to talk? I don't know if you think that it could be interesting, for example, the specific problems where the tools presented can stand out more as uh, simulation platforms for people interested in, in use them. So who wants to start, uh, Veronica or Professor Paglin? So are you, are you asking like where they have limitations kind of? Uh, where? I think there's the, the two points, the, the first one. Oh, question specific is, uh, biological, okay. Uh, but you can also talk about the limitations, so we have the two sides of the, of the same question. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously Tellurium fits really well for intracellular pathway-based or kinetic modeling. Um, I think it, because of integrating LibRoadRunner and I, I Herbert uh, mentioned some of these comments in the chat, but um, the just-in-time compiling down to, of the SPML to machine code makes the simulations really fast. And so this can really help us in terms of simulating very large models. Uh, so again, I think the speed is one of the main advantages with LibRoadRunner. And um, yeah, I guess Herbert also mentioned the like opportunity for distributed computing on clusters to uh, even further augment the speed. And that would potentially be helpful with some of the challenges we talked about in the parameter estimation with very large models where you have to perform many simulations that can be very uh, computationally costly. It's, it's a neat platform. We would, again, I, I put this in the chat window, but I'd be very interested to say if we could, you know, we, we want our model to continue to run both standalone, but also integrated with other things. Mm. It'd be very cool if you could eventually make physicel callable from within Tellarium. Uh, you know, both, uh, be a very interesting way to glue it to live roadrunner rather than working directly to glue it, although I think we still must need to do that. 
Yeah, you uh, could you could create a you could create a Python API to your tool. Um, then physio cell would be accessible from Python. That would be useful. Right, and I, I think that's something that's kind of in a long-term roadmap. And certainly, if someone wants to come to the hackathon next year and say, "Hey, I'd like to build a, a Pythonic wrapper to physio cell," we would definitely rubber stamp your application to join the funded hackathon, and you, yeah. you'd be on the first plane here. Um, <laughs> I think that'd be a great six-week visit if someone wants to continue kind of working on that too. We would be very happy to support that. So I think. Yeah. It's, long-term advantageous. Um, well, I think the yeah. underlying technical problem with that is, is how does one combine the hybrid um, dynamical models that are solved by uh, ODEs or Gillespie's algorithm with the um, diffusion equations that you model and, and synchronize the, the, the time progress of those hybrid integrators very carefully <laughs> um sorry that's that's not as funny as i thought it would be coming out um that's okay we're, we're going through these questions right now as we test sbml integration and certainly they're going to have to do some time scale analysis to, to pick appropriate uh, problems this really comes down to operator splitting and pretty much every hybrid model is doing operator splitting whether they realize it or not because your overall integrated model represents some humongous operator. And the only way you can actually do it is to solve your diffusion solver, go a little bit in time, freeze it, hold that quasi steady, do the agent model, then hold that quasi steady, and then do the diffusion and keep looping over and over and over again. So the question is, how big a time steps can get away with and not have humongous operator splitting errors? And even within our diffusion solver, we're solving that by operator splitting too, because we use a locally one-dimensional method, which turns it into a big vector of tridiagonal systems. Yay, you can use Thomas algorithms super fast, and you vectorize and basically it's a humongous tensor problem. God help you. Um, and then you want to put in uh, inputs and outputs into the cells, which becomes sources of sinks and diffusion. So the question is, do you need to do that at every time step? Or can you uh, find some way to lag it? I think part of it will be coming up with a well-defined interface between models and submodels. Uh, everyone in the SPML community seems to be obsessed with handling everything in SPML. And so mm -hmm. what they will do is they will overwrite all the beautiful source and sync codes we've written into BioFBM and PhysiCell and do it again in their SPML model. And we have to tell them to cut it out and say, write the source and sync rates. We'll keep doing those and piling up materials, raw materials inside your cell. We'll, we'll take care of the delivery business. We'll deliver substrates to you. You can use them, you can create them, and we'll take them away you know, at a fast time scale that matches. And then you can pick a different time scale for running the molecular model. Now, maybe that needs to run actually faster, maybe it needs to run slower, but there's no need to put all of it inside of the monolithic SPML model that we're trying to attach to you. Well, so, uh, hold on, though. SPML doesn't specify how to solve the model. And so um, it just specifies, the, it just specifies yeah. the model itself. So what do you mean? Could you explain that a bit more? Yeah, well, we're, it depends on what you're working with. Right now, I'd be happy to have one integrator, let alone a choice of seven or eight of them um, for the SPML models. I think Oh, that, 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 yeah, SPML doesn't specify the integrators. That's up to you. Yeah, OK. Yeah. And, and the reason for having multiple, the reason why people will implement multiple integrators is for verification purposes. Right. Well, they can check that what they're seeing is not an artifact on one integrator, but a different integrator gives you the same result. It's a really good idea. I, I'm i inclined to just take one method to optimize it very, very well. Uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, modern integrators are pretty reliable. Yeah, but it depends yeah. on what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, that's something that does excite us about live road runners. You guys have already done this very hard work at the molecular scale, but it does we do need to figure out how to pass the baton between the two model components and not lose accuracy. That's that's the big issue. Yeah, and there's and no, unfortunately, there's no theory to guide you. Right, other than trial and error. And exactly. Testing, yeah. Which is not a terrible thing to do. Um, because ultimately, we'd like to say, do 10 to the 1 ODEs per cell, 10 to the 4 cells, that's mm -hmm. 10 to the 5 ODEs. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 to the 5 runs, that's 10 to the 9 ODEs. That's a lot of mm -hmm. ODEs. Yeah. And it'd be really nice to find ways around it. And here's where I think even, you know, most of those, most of those will be running over very similar input spaces. So if we can build circuit models to approximate those network models, 
you would think between all the simulations running across the, plat the, the cluster that eventually you've hit most of input space. And so maybe we can train a surrogate to approximate it and eventually uh, replace it in the simulations. Or maybe that becomes a pre-processing step and say, oh, guess what? I don't need to support it anymore. I'll just support deep neural networks and uh, run the SPML models on a cluster uh, as a pre-processing step. So I mean, there are lots of things we could explore. Mm -hmm. I think though that the handoff is a really critical thing and just dividing, yeah. even coming up with some protocols to say, at least when you do it here, here's how you should do it. Mm -hmm. And it's well documented and well tested and you're kind of within known space. I, I think that's gonna be super, super helpful. I think the handoff and the slicing, the time slicing between the systems is the biggest issue mm -hmm. in that's all of multi-scale sure. modeling. And de divide, developing well-defined rules of the boundaries between the two models, who handles what. So you don't have two people trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. This is where, too, you know, Randy and I have talked a lot about this. Mm -hmm. And we're trying not to say that we support SPML. And try, we're trying to say we support molecular models written in SPML. Yeah, we don't want to support the full space of SPML, but use it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a language, and nothing more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, SPML doesn't support multicellular modeling, and it and it and it shouldn't. It should just be subcellular networks. Yeah. So. Yeah, because we want to be careful that we're using these as languages to write uh, a well-defined set of models, so that we know what they're going to do. Yeah, I'm I'm afraid of supporting the whole standard right off the bat, because it's just so many permutations. I don't think we're going to be able to to really predict what we're going to see. I mean, we support mo a lot of it, uh, except for de delayed differential equations um, and nonlinear algebraic solutions to nonlinear algebraic equations. Mm. Uh, but nobody else supports these either. They're very esoteric. Uh, as for the packages, we only support distrib uh, dis distributions, so you can specify um, confidence limits on your parameters, or you can specify um, specific noise sources and things like that mm. uh, into your model. And we also support composition, and we now support layout and render, but that's not published. In other words, you can you can now display your models as a as a visual network. Oh, that's cool. Which which you can you'll be you can be able to do that from Jupyter. So. No, that'd be cool. And if you need it, you could also graphically edit them like you do in Copacy. Um, yeah, now that's something that we, we won't do within this project, but we have a new project, as you know, with uh, Andy, um, mm -hmm. and they, we will be developing a cross-platform uh, ed editing viewer library, so people can host a network editor in whatever application they want. So now we can do for me. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but it's uh, time to close up the session. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone, thank you so much uh, you know, for coming. Thank you, Veronica and Dr. Macklin, for both presenting uh, your software. Um, th this is uh, the last one of our workshop series, um, but we're, we're going to be coming up with, um, I guess, a, a new schedule for our new series, which we'll be advertising shortly. Um, so as always, everyone, thank you for coming. Thanks, and thanks to Veronica for teaching us about Tellarium more. I can see why James Glazier is so excited about it now. It was really cool. Thank you for teaching us about physics, Al. <laughs> Very impressed. Okay. Uh